We welcome you today, Marsha Coyle. I hope you tell us about low politics and high politics in the court, and that you help us understand whether Chief Justice Roberts will be the uh, Jackson, Harlan, Frankfurter, Henry Friendly that many of us hope for, or he will follow a different Chief Justice that maybe you will name. So thank you and welcome. In the uh, summer of 2010, I was covering the confirmation hearings for Elena Kagan in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I received during those hearings two extraordinary emails. One email was from an editor at Simon & Schuster who was interested in a book about the Supreme Court. And the second email was uh, from a, a very faithful NewsHour fan, uh, a young man who attached a photo, and he asked me to marry him. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> he said he had no money, but he'd be very loyal. <laughs> So I immediately uh, showed that email to my husband, uh, who proposed to me some 30 years ago in a parking lot in downtown Baltimore. <laughs> Alas, there was no future in the marriage proposal, but the book proposal was intriguing, and I did follow up with the editor at Simon & Schuster. Uh, I was a little, you know, a little cautious about writing about the court at that point. It was 2010 and the Roberts Court was only five years old, and I worried a little bit, you know, maybe it was too soon to be writing about the court, and yet the editor and uh, the publisher of Simon & Schuster, after we sat down and talked a bit, we, we all came to the agreement that now, you know, this is a good time to begin looking at the court. Uh, it had stepped into some very major decisions, uh, into some very major controversies, and it had, by 2010, four new justices on the court. And there is this curiosity about what was going on. So I, I agreed to take on the book. Uh, I interviewed a number of justices for the book. And one of those justices, well, since the interview was off the record, uh, let's call him, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Harry Potter books or movies, he who shall not be named. <laughs> During the interview, in which we had been talking about the current court, the Roberts Court, he spontaneously said, I don't know why people call the Supreme Court after the name the Chief Justice. For example, we had the Warren Court, the Burger Court, the Rehnquist Court, and now we have the, Rehnquist, uh, the Roberts Court. And he said, why should Chief Justice Rehnquist be blamed for the decisions of that court? Instead, he suggested that the Supreme Court should be called after the president who named the most recent justice. Now, that would make this Supreme Court the Obama Court. And somehow, I think even after last term's health care ruling, this particular president would find it a big surprise that this was the Obama Supreme Court. Well, I've come here to tell you about my book, which is the story of the current court. I find that every Supreme Court term is a story in itself. It has multiple plots, unknown outcomes, and sometimes not even the same main characters. So that makes a book about the court exciting, fascinating, and challenging for the writer. And unfortunately, today I can't tell you the end to the latest chapter of the Roberts Court, uh, which is frustrating for all of us because we all want to know what will happen in the biggest cases of the term. For example, the affirmative action challenge involving the University of Texas, uh, the Shelby County, Alabama voting rights challenge in which the heart of the voting rights is at issue, and of course, the two same-sex marriage challenges. But by the end of June, we likely will know the outcome in those cases as well as a number of others that I think potentially make this term the most important term since John Roberts became Chief Justice now almost eight years ago. But you know, it's a funny thing. I and my colleagues said exactly the same thing about last term with health care and the Arizona immigration challenge. So it's really been an incredible two years in the life of the Roberts Court, 
and in the life of the Chief Justice, who during his confirmation hearings, if you remember, he said that he believed the court should not be at the center of the most divisive social and political issues of the times. Well, there are some issues that the court can't duck, uh, such as the health care challenge. There, the new federal health care law had been struck down by a federal appellate court, and that's one of the criteria for uh, the court getting involved in a case. On others, there are at least four justices who appear to want very much to be involved on certain issues, and one of those issues, I think, is race. As you get into my book, I try to show that the Roberts Court's conservative majority, which really is five justices, even though Justice Kennedy is often unpredictable, he is conservative, is really a very confident majority and they are unafraid to deliver jolts to the legal system or to society, as with the Second Amendment ruling in the D.C. gun case or the Citizens United campaign finance case. And they're also unafraid to act in some not-so-conservative ways, such as overruling old decisions, some very old decisions, and some not-so-very-old decisions, and then also refusing to defer to elected officials, be they local officials, state officials, or members of Congress. So when I use the phrase conservative, I'm talking more not about politics so much as restraint. Conservative courts are known to be restrained courts. I see the court often because I go to most of the oral arguments, and I've become very familiar with their faces on the bench but it's important to remember that this is still a young court in one sense. Before John Roberts took his seat in September of 2005, the court's membership had not changed in 11 years. That was the second longest period in the Supreme Court's history without a change in membership. And then in just the next five years, we had three new justices join Roberts, so roughly half the court turned over in those five years. So when I was writing the book, I wondered, you know, what does that mean to the justices, you know, not on a personal level as well as in terms of the work they do? One justice told me, and I quote, it's going to be different. You develop not only a relationship with the court, but individual relationships as well. I miss David Souter very, very much. Like anything else, you suddenly get a new member of the family and you try to get to know them, to establish a relationship with them, how they like to deal with, the co with their colleagues, be it a close personal re relationship or to maintain a more distant one. It adds a new element. And then you do it a year again later. It reshuffles the deck. Another justice said, old alliances people you could rely on for certain positions in prior cases aren't there anymore. And of course, a new justice may tip the balance in a certain area of the law in a different direction. And we saw that occur in the campaign finance law with the much disliked Citizens United ruling. For a little bit of history, when she sat on the court, Justice O'Connor supported limits on money in elections. Justice Alito, who succeeded her, tipped what was then a 5-4 balance that with O'Connor had been in favor of those limits to 5-4 against limits on corporate and union independent spending. And we may see the same dynamic play out again this term when the court decides the University of Texas affirmative action case. The last time the justices looked at affirmative action was in 2003 in a case involving the, and I mean affirmative action in higher education, in a case uh, in 2003 involving the University of Michigan. Justice O'Connor wrote the decision holding that diversity in higher education was a compelling interest and Michigan's law school's admissions policy was constitutional. I think after hearing the oral arguments in the University of Texas case that we may face 
a very different outcome. Based on sentiments expressed by the Chief Justice and endorsed by Justice Alito in the 2007 rulings involving the Louisville and Seattle school cases that I, I write about in my book, there is a real possibility that the court could overrule the Michigan decision and as is so often the case, the outcome may depend on Justice Kennedy. I like to think I had great foresight in choosing the cases that I did for my book. You know, this is a book in general about the first seven years of the Roberts Court. It's also a book very specifically about four landmark rulings. And I use those rulings to draw you through those seven years. I think I was lucky in the sense that although all four landmark decisions uh, by the Roberts Court, uh, you know, stand out still in our minds, the issues they raise have never really ended with those decisions. Right now we have a race back on the docket in the voting rights and affirmative action case. Uh, we have a big campaign finance case scheduled for next term, and it's brought to the court by the very same lawyer who brought Citizens United to the court. I'm almost positive we're going to see another gun challenge, if not next, next term, maybe the term after. Uh, there's a lot of uh, litigation going on around the country right now, trying to flesh out the scope of the Second Amendment right that the court recognized in the D.C. gun decision. And I'm almost positive as well that there will be more health care challenges coming to the court involving the new health care law. Uh, in particular, right now, moving quickly through the lower courts are challenges by uh, employers who claim uh, religious objections to providing certain types of coverage, and almost always it's coverage involving birth control uh, or birth control-related uh, medicine. But let me tell you a little bit about why I chose the four cases that I did. From the very beginning, I wanted to do something a little different with this book about the court. Uh, most books about the court focus, say, either on the confirmation process for justices or about the court itself in action. Uh, but I wanted to tell also the backstories to some of the cases that get to the Supreme Court. We in the media just really scratch the surface of these stories. Uh, we may do it in a preview of upcoming arguments in a case, but we really don't get a chance to home down or focus on the people involved in the case, the, the clients, uh, the lawyers, the kind of strategy they do. So that, that was one of the reasons why I, I wanted to tell the back stories. Uh, I wanted, obviously, landmark decisions that would be associated with the Roberts Court for years to come, and I think these four cases will be. And I wanted 5-4 decisions, not because I want to show the court is always ideologically divided. In fact, in the book, I point out, and I really hope people take notice, that every term, usually more than 50% of the court's decisions are either unanimous or 7-2 or 8-1 rulings. So there is a lot of consensus across this bench, even though they divide uh, deeply and sometimes bitterly in certain areas of the law. I also sought, obviously, cases that had good backstories. And finally, I wanted cases that you cared about, that you would talk about when the decisions came down uh, and uh, that you probably would continue to talk about as more litigation arose. Uh, the health care case was added late in the book process, and I knew it was going to be added. I, uh, in fact, one of the justices I, was asking me what my deadline on the book was, and I said, well, it was at the end of this summer, but then you took health care. And this justice looked at me and said, well, you knew that was going to happen. <laughs> So uh, I did, but there wasn't a lot of time between the court's decision and my book's deadline to do as much with that case as I, as I had hoped to do. But you will meet in my book, for example, a Seattle mother, Kathleen Brose, 
uh, whose unsuccessful effort to get her daughter into one of Seattle's top high schools uh, led to a lawsuit challenging the school district's use of a race tiebreaker, one of uh, three or four tiebreakers, in, that the school district used to decide which students could get into oversubscribed high schools. Uh, Brost describes herself as a mama bear before Sarah Palin coined the term. And you'll also get to meet David Bossi, head of the activist conservative organization Citizens United. He is a colorful political operative with a somewhat uh, checkered past. Uh, he wanted to run ads for his highly critical movie about Hillary Clinton uh, when she was a presidential candidate, but he didn't want to disclose his funding sources and he didn't want the law, the election law's limits on when he could run the ads or the movie to apply to him. And then, as you're probably familiar, there's a certain security guard named Dick Heller who carried a gun on his job uh, when he was guarding a federal office building in Washington. But because of D.C.'s handgun ban, he couldn't have a gun at home, and he lived in a sketchy area of D.C., in some of these cases, also, in fact, in most of them, you'll find very smart conservative and libertarian lawyers who carefully recruited the most sympathetic clients they could find, and they also strategically picked courthouses in which to begin their lawsuits. Uh, in Florida, for example, uh, the state attorney general at the time, Republican Bill McCollum, who would eventually lead 26 Republican state attorneys general in the challenge to the new health care law, he looked to a court that was about 200 miles away from his own office to file the lawsuit yeah. instead of the federal court that was right down the street from his office. And he did it, and the lawyers who worked with him as well chose that court 200 miles away because it had all Republican appointed judges, and also because it had a very small criminal docket, and he didn't want the health care lawsuit to be slowed down as the criminal cases took priority over civil cases. The four cases also reveal deep divides on the court over racial classifications in the 14th Amendment, guns and the Second Amendment, money in elections and the First Amendment, and finally, health care and Congress's power to legislate under Article I of the Constitution. In the Seattle-Louisville school race cases, four justices endorsed the notion of a colorblind Constitution, but Justice Kennedy felt that a colorblind Constitution was still aspirational and he would not go as far as the other four conservative justices went, although he agreed that the use of the race tiebreaker by the Seattle and Louisville school districts was unconstitutional. But that decision, and now that David points out how close we are to another Brown versus Board of Education anniversary, also revealed a really startling disagreement over the meaning of the landmark Brown versus Board of Education. And I, I really recommend that you uh, spend a little time, if you can, reading what John Roberts said was the meaning of Brown versus what Justice Stevens said in his dissenting opinion. It's hard to believe after so many years there could still be uh, any real dispute as to what happened in Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, Justice Scalia graciously let me put certain things on the record in the interview with him, and he told me that the decision in the D.C. gun case was the greatest vindication of originalism. That's his approach to constitutional interpretation. Although four justices agreed in the outcome of the D.C. gun case, there really are only two reliable originalists on the court right now, Justices Scalia and Justice uh, Clarence Thomas. I was surprised to find that this major landmark case really started with two very young lawyers sharing drinks 
in D.C. one evening and talking about a, a decision out of a, a case in Texas that involved the Second Amendment, one of the, I think, the first case uh, in 70-some years to find that the Second Amendment was an individual right, and saying to each other, you know, somebody should bring a Second Amendment challenge and get it to the Supreme Court. And then they looked at each other and said, hey, we're lawyers, we should do that. <laughs> and they did, and they succeeded. Citizens United, says the lawyer who actually argued and won the case, is probably the most hated decision since Bush v. Gore. There is a long history in the Supreme Court on campaign finance, just as there is on race. Here, too, the justices have starkly different views of the First Amendment's guarantee of free speech. I say that an aggressive conservative majority turned a narrow campaign finance case into a major one with tremendous ramifications for elections in America. And behind the scenes, there was a struggle among the justices as to how to deliver this particular jolt to the legal system and to the American public. So all four cases had high stakes not only for the lawyers and the people involved in the cases, but also for organizations with agendas containing the issues raised. And those organizations came out in droves when the cases got to the Supreme Court. I began by telling you that this term had the potential to be as important as the last term. And I'd like to spend a few minutes returning to that. I, I learned a long time ago never to predict outcomes on the basis of oral arguments, which I religiously stick to on the news hour. The only one I predict to is my husband, who has learned to promptly forget what I say, so it never comes back to haunt me. <laughs> we seem right now, and I think you'd probably agree, to be living in a hyper-partisan time, and I think that continues to present a difficult challenge for the Supreme Court in general, and the Chief Justice in particular, for the first time in decades, there is a direct correlation between the ideological breakdown of the court's membership and the political party of the appointing president. That wasn't the case when John Paul Stevens and David Souter were on the court. Uh, they were considered part of the court's liberal wing, but they were Republican appointees. But today, there are five Republican appointees and four Democratic ones. And so, when the court splits 5-4 ideologically, I think there is this feeling that the court is playing politics or, and not applying law. Uh, about a year or so ago, Justice Ginsburg said in an interview, what I care most about, and I think most of my colleagues do, too, is that we want this institution to maintain the position that it has had in this system where it is not considered a political branch of government. And that was the great risk for the court in both the health care and Arizona immigration cases last term. If there had been a clear ideological political divide in both decisions, it would have fed a view of the court as making political, not legal decisions. And it also would have fed the political machinery of both parties in the presidential election. I personally can't remember a time when there was such a forceful effort to get justices recused from cases as we saw with the efforts against Justices Kagan and Thomas in the health care cases. I also think there is a deep vein of cynicism about the court and how the justices do their jobs. Uh, I'm one of those very strange people who, whenever there is a story about the Supreme Court in the newspaper or online, I tend to go down to the public comments and I read, well, I read maybe at least 20 of them. And when they go on for 500, I, I can't do that. But I do like to read the public comments to see what people are saying. And I really have been struck about the cynicism and sometimes outright hostility reflected in those comments, which almost always end up referring to the decision in the campaign finance case, Citizens United. So the stakes for the court and the American people were very high last term. 
I do think John Roberts tries whenever possible to find consensus among his colleagues. And it's just not easy. Uh, <laughs> I remember uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist once uh, was sitting with some of us, and uh, the complaint came up from one reporter. You know, the justices write so many separate opinions. Can't you do anything about that? Can't you just have one dis one opinion for the court in a particular case? And he just sat there and he laughed. You know, it was like saying, uh, "It's it is like herding cats. They they all are very independent minded." Uh, and I think that some of them also have very strong views about certain areas of the law. Uh, John Roberts is a, a very confident judge, although a young justice, and he has strong uh, views in certain areas, especially race. I think that's one of them. He did not achieve consensus in the health care in Arizona immigration cases, but he did achieve a semblance of bipartisanship. He joined the wing of the court the left wing of the court in upholding the individual mandate to buy insurance. And two justices on the so-called left, Justices Breyer and Kagan, moved to the right in finding a problem with the Medicaid expansion in the law. And those votes succeeded in neutralizing the court as a political issue in the presidential campaign. So you come back to, well, what was the court doing? Was it practicing law or was it practicing politics? And I think that's one of the most profoundly difficult questions to answer, although I did ask it, and every justice would say they never practice politics. Uh, but why is it so hard to tell? Retired Justice Souter uh, recently gave a talk in New Hampshire at the New Hampshire Historical Society, and he he spoke about the range of language in the Constitution. Some language, he said, is very specific. For example, the Constitution tells you that the president has to be 35 years old. But other language is very broad or has extraordinary breadth in his word and he, words. And he gave as an example the Fourth Amendment, protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, what is unreasonable? And even the First Amendment, freedom of speech. He said those general terms are best understood as a listing of values or a menu of approved values, the application of which has got to be worked out over time. And a great deal of what the court does is attempt to figure out the application of those values. But he also pointed out that sometimes the values compete. And he gave as an example, Citizens United. In that case, a liberty approach to free expression says corporations can spend all the money they want, independent of candidates. On the other hand, an equality approach would say there has to be some limits on corporate spending so corporations don't drown out other speech. But the Constitution doesn't contain a provision telling the justices how to resolve that tension. So then Justice Souter was asked, well, how does the public then judge the justices? And he said, the public has to read the decisions. <laughs> Is that asking too much? No, well, maybe. He went on to explain that a principled decision is one in which the court candidly and convincingly explains why this principle prevailed over that principle. He said, it's the choice of principles that is the tough part. The public judgment has got to be a judgment on whether they believe what the court says, whether they believe what the court says is convincing in making that choice between principles. I hope when you finish the book, you'll find, uh, as I found, and uh, as the justices really, I think, make clear, there really are no easy cases in the Supreme Court, or we wouldn't need a Supreme Court. And as one justice told me, there is no relationship between the difficulty of a case and its importance. It could be the most insignificant case, but it's a bear figuring out the right answer. So I could talk to you about the court, its cases, and the justices for the rest of the afternoon, there is so much to learn, 
And I'm still learning about the court, even though I've been covering it for more than 20 years. But I, I hope uh, when you finish the book, you'll come away from it with a more nuanced view of how the court does its job and of the individual justices as well.